I've done the worst drinks of the 70s. I've done weird drinks from the 1880s. I've done cursed cocktails today on how to drink worst drinks of the 80s. So the worst drinks of the 80s. That's a pretty subjective idea. I mean, I could pick just about anything, right? So I needed something to help me narrow it down. And thankfully, the 1988 film Cocktail gives me exactly what I need. Brian Flanagan, played by Tom Cruise, is bartending at a place called The Cell Block, which by the way is absolutely ridiculous. Insanity, if you ever watch this movie, which is also not the feel-good 80s movie that you might be expecting if you've never seen it. It's depressing. Uplifting? but depressing. He does this bit where he's the last poet bartender where he lists all of the horrible cocktails that the patrons have had him make. The Golden Hammer, the Alabama Slammer. I make things with juice and froth, the pink squirrel, the three-toed sloth. So I've got my list of drinks from the movie Cocktail, 1988, Tom Cruise. So we're gonna make a velvet hammer. It's a shaken drink, so we're gonna shake it up. And like so many drinks from this list, it involves no juices of any kind, nothing fresh at all. <laughs> we need one ounce of vodka, squish into there. I need three quarters of an ounce of triple sec. Zip. It's funny, I actually did a drink from cocktail forever ago. I did the red eye, because uh, I thought cocktail would be a good fit for the channel, because it's a cocktail channel. Turns out, nobody cares about that movie and nobody watched that episode. But this episode that you clicked on was packaged around the worst drinks of the 80s. So I got gotcha. you. You ready for the big time young Mr. Flanagan? I think I can handle it. Took me five years, but I finally got you to watch an episode about the movie Cocktail. Three quarters of an ounce of a white creme de cacao. One and a half ounces of milk or half and half. I happen to have half and half here and a quarter ounce of grenadine. I'm ready to shake this up and I'm gonna pour it in a glass. I'm gonna actually use this like coupe. I guess it'll be fine for it. I forgot my bar spoon, so I'm going to attempt to use this bottle opener. I don't think it's gonna work very good because I don't have any kind of a parabola. That was good though. Well, here we go. This is a velvet hammer. First off, the triple sec is loud. I mean, you smell it. It slapped me in the face. There's so much more orange in this than I ever would have expected. I mean, I made it right, right? I got the creme de cacao. Did I like under pour? I'm gonna remake this because I honestly think that it's, it's out of balance. I must have like blanked out and under poured the creme de cacao. So let's find out. Starting over. Here we go, the Velvet Hammer. No, I had it right last time. No, it's a little, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I didn't. It's a little bit more balanced, but the, the triple sec is loud. It's way more orangey than I would have thought this drink would be. Less chocolatey. It's a little bit like drinking melted ice cream. <laughs> the idea that you would drink this at your table and then look at your date and say, let's hit the dance floor. Oh God. <laughs> Just <laughs> There's puke everywhere. A star never pukes or passes out in public. Yeah. Ah! Two more velvet hammers, my good man. I don't think that's gonna work out unless like, um, unless booger sugar has like some like anti-vomiting power. I, I don't think it does though. This is, um, it's candy. Could you like do a riff on that that would be better? Probably, I could probably do a velvet hammer that would be better. I kind of don't want to, I kind of want to move this thing along. I mean, it's orange and chocolate at its center. The vodka is doing nothing. It's just adding a little bit of proof and thinning it out. I always go for rum, rum would be good there. I mean, bourbon would be good there too. Uh, gin, uh, not a gin drink, not with the cream in it especially. Yeah, and then like up the proof a little bit, like do another half an ounce of actual spirits. Maybe cut your liqueurs a little bit. Yeah, maybe throw some like chocolate bitters in there, orange bit, you know, like, or just anga. Like uh, literally, as he does, he reaches for, um, you know what, let's fucking, hold on. Got another idea here. Just very quickly. This is Dale DeGroff's Pimento Dram. I almost never use it. And the reason it suddenly is in my mind 
is because I had read a blog about how this movie was like the last of its breed because the year before this movie came out, Dale DeGroff took over as head bartender at the Rainbow Room and uh, uh, he was basically creating, planting the seeds of the cocktail revival as we come to know it. Basically, everybody who set off the cocktail renaissance, the speakeasy renaissance, whatever you want to call it, kind of grows out of Dale DeGroff's time at the Rainbow Room. It's all people he trained and the people that they trained and the principles that he codified. Just adding a little spice to it. It's still too sweet, it's still very desserty, but it's a lot less one note. There's a lot more going on in there. And honestly, it's like a drink now that I would probably finish. You know what you do? You make this into a tiki drink, you put it on crushed ice and up it with rum. It's delish. It probably already exists. I just don't have that kind of an encyclopedic knowledge. All right, so this is a drink that I have taken inspiration from on the show, but I've never actually made it on the show. It's a drink called an angel's tit. Before you say, oh, that can't be right, it is right. And it's actually a really old drink. And yes, it meant the same thing then as it does now. We're gonna do white creme de cacao, and uh, we're gonna layer this. So it's a half an ounce of creme de cacao. Probably the best part about this drink is that it's gonna be room temperature. So hopefully we'll be able to layer these. They are going to be identical in color. Half an ounce here does appear to be floating right across the top. I need a half an ounce of milk and or a cream and or fat. And that's our angel's tit. It's a Coughlin's law, I suppose. I think this is a, a just shoot it. I mean, fucking why? Blah. I'd rather have a prairie oyster. My grandmother used to love these things called cherry cordials. They were little chocolate balls filled with cherry syrup and a cherry in each one. Cherry, cherry blossom. Well, it's big chocolate on the outside. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not at all what I want from an alcoholic <laughs> beverage. It tastes a little bit like a very sweetened old couch. It has a kind of a musty vibe to it. And I think a part of that is that like, my cherry is a very good cherry, which has a lot of complexity in it, as opposed to like a neon, you know, like a maraschino cherry of the American variety. And maybe that's what it's supposed to have, something that has no flavor and no character. But like they carry certain, I don't know, I never really thought about it before now, but like, I guess a little bit of earthy notes. And when you mix them up with this like creamy, sweet chocolate, Stat. No, not not having it. It reminds me slightly of the whole panoply of Italian Christmas cookies. All of them. Take your pick, you know, Pizzella. Uh, I can't pronounce that properly. Uh, the other ones, all of them. It is a bad drink by just about every metric by which you would measure a drink. It is a bad drink. It is a highly sweet, syrupy, I think this should just be the look of the show from now on, honestly. I really like the way the jacket and teal vibe comes off. I think the Miami Vice look is one that um, is great and that looks good on me, specifically. I love coffee. It's an important part of my life and my daily ritual, and that's why I'm so happy that Trade is a sponsor of this episode, because Trade is super cool. They help me discover new coffees because they've got over 55 awesome roasters making all kinds of coffee, and they ship it straight to my front door, all roasted to order. And also, as much as I love coffee, I do find that picking out new beans to try can be overwhelming. So many species and places of origin and roasts and blends and farms and all that. Well, Trade maps your specific preferences to hundreds of different flavor profiles and uses that to pair you with coffees that are perfect to your taste. Part art, it's part science. I think there's a dash of machine learning and a little industry expertise. They toss all that together and I get all these fun little surprises in the mail and I love surprises. I find something enjoyable at every single roast I get like this, necessary coffee. Strong partners make rich coffee, dark roast. Well, I am enjoying it. So here's the thing, if you love coffee and want more of it, you should go to drinktrade.com slash how to drink or hit the link in the pinned comment or the one that's up here in the corner to sign up and you'll get $15 off of select plans and your first bag of coffee free. And now back to the show. Oh man, that's really good, I love coffee. All right, next drink. Here we go, a Friar Tuck. Do I shake this? I'm gonna shake this. I think we should shake a Friar. I've decided let's shake this drink for my own sanity. 
All right, we need uh, two ounces of milk and or half and half. I need one ounce of hazelnut liqueur. I need one ounce of frangelico. And now a whole ounce of this other sugar syrup called dark creme de cacao. Just ounces and ounces of syrup. Okay. One fryer tuck coming up. Oh God. In my efforts to make that look good on a close-up, I made a mess. We have a very aerated, frothy, creamy, almost whipped cream kind of drink. This is going to be yet another melted ice cream cocktail of a, oh my God, it smells like Halloween. It smells like sticking your face into your pillowcase full of Halloween chocolates. And I'm gonna tell you something, that's not a good smell. It tastes like chocolate milk with a hazelnut finish. I mean, it is hazelnut liqueur, creme de cacao, and heavy cream or milk. What was I expecting? I mean, there's really not a drink there. I, look, I've got some, I got some rum. I'm just like trying to turn this into a cocktail. I can't call that a cocktail. I don't know what you call it. I'm getting some banana scent notes off of this uh, Hamilton Ministry of Rum. Jamaica Black. Let's see if that helps it. This is like a cocktail that you would invent for a nine-year-old. <laughs> it's just like awful. I mean, that's at least on the right road. We've taken it from milk chocolate and turned it into dark chocolate. There's some burning sugar caramel notes in there. Maybe that particular rum was a little too funky for this, but I also don't know that you don't want a Jamaican style funky rum to proof this up and turn it into a real drink. I think a lot of these, they're like half a drink. Like an ounce of creme de cacao, an ounce of hazelnut and two ounces of milk. It's like missing a base spirit, you know? I would never build a cocktail like that ever in a million years. Hard to say it's oh retch inducing, but it's also kind of hard to call it a cocktail. It's kind of like just sort of a weird disaster. Boring, overly sweet, Delicious, like the way candy is. I'm not really down with it. So the next drink is a ding-a-ling. I have found information that suggests it's another way of saying Singapore sling. That might be true. Uh, the Singapore sling would have been on menus in the 80s, and I'm sure you would have gotten a really bad Singapore sling. There's also a recipe out there that if you search for this, you'll find in Difford's Guide. That is actually a recipe invented by Difford himself because he couldn't find a recipe for a ding -a He's like, I'll just come up with one. So I don't think that that's got any officialness to it whatsoever. I found another recipe that feels legit, and that's the one I wanna make for you, but things are a little bit of a mess here. We're gonna start by taking a lime. I'm gonna cut this lime in half, and then I'm gonna cut that half into quarters, make some wedges. Just cut it up, throw them in your shaker. I think that's the idea. We're gonna throw in a quarter ounce of simple. Follow it up with some passion fruit syrup. Yeah, sure, third of an ounce. Maybe my just accidentally poured a half an ounce. Okay, so I want three quarters of an ounce of Galliano. It's a little bottle of Galliano. I had to go to three liquor stores today to find this. Now I want three quarters of an ounce of vodka. There we go. And I'm gonna tell you a little secret. You can use any vodka you want. And that's it, we shake that up and we try it out. Let's see if it's any good. This drink feels like one you dump. Let's see how the, uh, the old girl is. Whoa, whoa, that's, whoa, that's way better than I thought it was gonna be. That's pretty cool, it isn't, it is not unlike a caperina. Um, shit. It's got a lot of floral notes. It is very fresh. It is very bright, reasonably well balanced, not tremendously sweet, not bone dry. It's not like a spirit forward drink, but that's taste. Damn. <laughs> I, nah, no complaints. If that's what a dingling is, then like, yeah, I'm for that. I am for that. Yeah, that's just good. I've never had a drink with Galliano in it that was good too. Like that's kind of a, whoo, that's a surprise. 
happen to have this 20% saline. I'm just gonna throw two dashes in there. This just feels like the right kind of fruit to have a little saline in it, uh, a little salt. It definitely doesn't take anything away. I don't know how much it's adding. Err on the side of caution and throw it in because I think it's probably helping it tastes more strongly of passion fruit and lime. Got a little of the salt there. It goes through a tick of watermelon rind too. Man, that's kind of cool. If that's the ding Brian Flanagan was talking about, it may be the, the best drink he made. Genuinely pretty cool. I'm very comfortable calling this drink a variation on the Caperosca. I think it might be even better with cachaça. I know it'd be better with cachaça, just make it with cachaça. Cause like that's the only thing it's missing is that 55 gallon drum funk. I don't know what else to call it. Pretty good. All right, next drink. The Alabama Slammer! Yeah. Let's make an Alabama Slammer! We're gonna start with our half an ounce of lemon juice. There we go. Half an ounce of lemon juice, half an ounce of slow gin. Sipsmith slow gin. Uh, I need an ounce of Southern Comfort, my old enemy. I fucking hate Southern Comfort. I'm a reviled spirit from the abyss. I need one ounce of Amaretto. Get some ice. Bada bing. This is an Alabama slammer. I'm not gonna slam it because I'm slammed. <sighs> oh fuck. Why would you do that to yourself? You have so much to live for. God damn. Turn me into the fucking Tasmanian devil over here. Holy shit. When I was six years old, I used to go play Nintendo. Nintendo at a kid's house down the block from me. And they had a very specific brand of potpourri in their house. And that is what this drink tastes like. Memory is a powerful flavor enhancer. This is the taste of Nintendo in 1987. Oh my God, that is gyroid and excite bike all day long. Wow, I hate it. Uh, some Robitussin action in there, a little cough syrup. There are so many better things you could put in your mouth. Good Lord, that's a bad drink. It's somewhere between watermelon and cherry Italian ice off of a smoking diesel burning Italian ice truck that used to come around my neighborhood. <laughs> it's, it's an affront to God. I really got nothing else to say about it. I think I've said enough. I think I've said enough. You know, it's a good time for me to mention, by the way, that Visky is the official glassware provider of how to drink and that all of the beautiful glassware you see on the show was provided by Visky. If you want to pick up any of their beautiful glassware, as I love and enjoy, uh, use the link in the pin comment below or up here in that corner and code how to drink 15 at checkout. You will get 15% off of your order uh, from Visky. And thank you for sponsoring the show, Biz. All right, so there's a drink that he mentions called a three-toed sloth. Now, as far as I and everybody else that I have found talk about this can figure, no such drink exists. If I was gonna make a three-toed sloth, I think it would have to have banana in it, even though I don't really think of bananas and sloths as going together specifically. Like, I don't think they eat them, but there's uh, they live in a place where bananas grow. And you know, you ever seen their claws? They remind me of bananas. So I think it's got banana in it. I think it's probably some version of a rum runner. So let's start here with a banana liqueur. Or how about half an ounce? And I think my base spirit is gonna be grapefruit vodka. Yeah, I think that could be good actually. Let's do one and a quarter ounces of grapefruit vodka. Let's do half an ounce of Rum Haven, which is a coconut rum that is way better than Malibu. Let's do a quarter ounce of blue curacao. Let's see what I got in there. It's like a seafoam green. Uh, honestly, that sounds like, that, that tastes like what I want it to taste like. It is nutty and banana-y and tropical. That seems like the drink. I think we may have just invented the three-toed sloth. Let's get a glass and some ice. Let's see if this three-toed sloth that I just invented is any good. It has a kind of a seafoam green kind of look. I don't know how I feel about that. No, I don't hate that. 
I mean, I don't hate that in the context of any of these other 80s drinks. It's much nuttier than I would have expected it to be. It has a kind of nutty chocolate banana vibe. It reminds me a little bit of a less sweet banana split. Honestly, it's pretty good. If I was to garnish that, orange twist. Yeah, that's kind of actually huge in the drink. It balances out the flavors a lot, actually. Helps it um, register a little bit more citrusy. Wakes up some floral notes that are hidden in there. Still nutty, still banana-y, chocolatey a little bit, even though there's no chocolate. I don't actually get coconut. I think it's a, kind of a flavor synthesis that's happening there. It's pretty cool. I, honestly, like, try that out. That's uh, three toad sloth, I have decided. All right, next drink from our Cell Block poem in 1988's movie Cocktail, starring Tom Cruise, who's a very good actor with a very problematic lifestyle. Honestly, you can't deny it. The man knows how to act. He's good. He's very, very good. He's good. The iced tea, the kamikaze, the orgasm, oh, the death man. spasm. <laughs> kamikaze is a really simple drink. I have had an embarrassing amount of these in my youth. In fact, there was one night in which I achieved what I consider to be the transcendent perfect drunk in a hotel room in Atlantic City. I lined up 14 kamikaze shots and drank them all. No hangover, just a wonderful feeling of perfect drunkness. Normally this would be like a shot. You do one ounce of vodka, half an ounce, triple sack, half an ounce of lime juice. Uh, we're just gonna triple all of that. About here is where we want the drink to come to. This is like a 12 ounce glass. It is an insanely large glass. I'm never gonna get that on this drink, but that's okay. Let's cut our limes in half. We're tripling this drink for the wash line, so I'm gonna use an ounce and a half of lime juice. I need an ounce and a half of triple sec. Cointreau, this is a very top shelf kamikaze. Only the very finest kamikaze for the how to drink audience. And uh, three ounces of vodka for this very top shelf kamikaze. I probably should be using Grey Goose for that top shelf ripoff theme. Grey Goose is shit vodka. It's the 80s. Maybe we should see some throwing bottles. We could do something like that. Woo, mostly. There it is, a huge bucket of kamikaze. To 2003. Woo! That is bracing. It's a very tart, very lime forward drink. It is super duper 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 lime. It's very, very tart. It's very, very bright. And to be fair, it's very refreshing. So many of these drinks have been just absolutely cloyingly, throat cloggingly creamy sweet. And finally we have a drink that honestly is nice. It's actually a little out of balance in the other direction. I mean, a hint of sweetness would do a lot for this drink. Just a, uh, just a, a part, a little piece of simple syrup would just be huge. But on the whole, it's kind of hard to fault it as, uh, in this collection of 80s drinks. The kamikaze here is maybe the second best drink other than this version of the dingaling, which I cannot say is an official 1988 dingaling. Uh, it's tart, it's refreshing, it's bitter, it's biting, it's cold, it is crisp. It is very one note though. This is a glass of lime juice. Zap! Limey, limey, lime juice, you know? All right, next up, we're gonna make a drink called an orgasm of the screaming variety. And this is another no fruit juice, oh, uh, syrups cocktail. One ounce of vodka, one ounce of Kahlua, one ounce of Amaretto. Yo, dog, I heard you like sweet. So I put sweet with your sweet. So you could sweet while you tweet. Because now I want one ounce of Bailey's, if you can believe it. Two ounces of milk and or heavy cream. It's important to miss a good portion of the shaker when you do that. Yeah. 
Here it is, your screaming orgasm. You might be thinking this drink looks like a lot of other drinks in this episode, and you would be right. Of the milky amaretto chocolate drinks today, this might be my favorite. Sweet, chocolatey, and uh, heavy. Very heavy. This is a drink made of milk, and chocolate milk, and cream, and sugar. And it kind of makes you want to take a nap and lie down. I'm not into it, to be honest, but like I can also see why it would be popular. It goes down really easy. I don't know, man. If I, if I drank two or three of these, I'm gonna feel like shit in a way that nothing else is gonna make me feel like shit. That is brutal. It is so sweet, so over the top, just not good. Very thick, very thick, very uh, uh, heavy mouth feel, very syrupy. Um, it's just the kind of thing that's gonna make you feel sick. There is a couple of good puke scenes in that movie. What was it? She was uh, drinking champagne in the sun. Champagne, perfume going in, sewage coming out. That's a great line. So the last drink that Brian Flanagan, our protagonist, mentions in his very long poem of bartending is a death spasm. This drink, as far as I can tell, does not exist. Until now, we're gonna make it up. If there were to be a drink called a death spasm, it would be some kind of a combination of a death in the afternoon and an orgasm, which we just made. I have jotted down some ingredients as my finale to this episode. I shall invent a death spasm. And this may not end up being an 80s drink, it might just be a drink. Uh, we definitely need to get some kind of bubbly in there, champagne or Prosecco. I have a bottle of Prosecco around here on set somewhere. That's the Prosecco we're gonna use. And we need to have some coffee notes in there. The Baileys, I gotta drop. I don't see how that's gonna work in here. And I'm gonna keep the Amaretto. So let's start it up. I also think that this is going to be primarily a drink that involves coffee and rum. Also, I want to caveat. I'm making one attempt at this. I will not workshop this drink because I am many drinks in and having a hard time even getting through this. So we're going to do this drink and that's the end of the episode. If it sucks, it sucks. If he dies, he dies. I must break you. Let's start with one ounce of rum, and we're gonna get some coffee liqueur in there, three quarters of an ounce, actually, of Mr. Black coffee liqueur. Uh, we wanna add a little sweet and a little character. Let's add some of our Velvet Falernum. I'm gonna do a whole half an ounce. I wanna do a quarter ounce to a half an ounce of Curacao, because coffee and orange go together way better than you would think. I think that's the drink, honestly, right there. We're on it, as far as I'm concerned. Amaretto, right, I did say that the drink calls for amaretto. I'm gonna start with a scant quarter ounce. That's good. That just lightly sweetens it up in a very nutty way. Let's do a spritz of absinthe right down in there. We need to get some shake action going. Two ice cubes going in my glass. Take your glass, strain this drink right in there. This is the wild card, we gotta add some Prosecco. Don't point the Prosecco at anything you don't wanna destroy. Pop that top and top our drink. Beautiful. And I think we want a twist of lemon on top of this. You know what? I was thinking about perching it on the side, but I'm just gonna drop it straight in. And uh, maybe this monstrosity is a death spasm. We'll see. It's not bad. It's very Prosecco-y for my taste. I don't really love that. But as far as a bubbly Prosecco cocktail goes, this is pretty great. It has a lot of coffee presence. It has some more Demerara-y notes. It's a little bottomier. Am I getting amaretto? I don't know about that. 
It's definitely something very, very slow to drink because of the bubbles. Other than that, it's quite balanced. The lemon and the coffee are offsetting each other very nicely. You get this very dry wine expression from the Prosecco. Its sweetness is definitely present, but not overwhelming. And that of course is coming primarily from our Falernum and our Amaretto. And those are like the intentional notes. Additionally, there's a nuttiness from all of those flavors interacting with the rum and a banana note, which I think, I mean, this is a blended rum says Barbados, but I, I, I think that there's a little banana funk that's been buried down deep in there that is being brought out by Prosecco and lemon particularly that's showing up. We're getting a little bit of that. On the whole, I'm gonna call this a successful drink. It's absolutely not the drink that I want after all of the crap I drank in this episode. It would definitely be a topper to a night of vomiting, but Really what this is, is actually like a brunch drink. You know, if you think about brunch drinks, a lot of them have champagne or Prosecco in them. And here we've added coffee, which is of course a breakfast beverage. This is a great drink for a brunch. This would go so well with like, just the right kind of like soft scrambled eggs with some, oh, some salmon, maybe even some capers on very like artisanal toast. The champagne, the Prosecco note, and the lemon, they are really buddies, but they're not overtaking the rest of the drink. Absinthe, is it present? It's very incorporated into the other flavors here. I wouldn't take it out. I think that if you took it out, you would notice it was missing. It's moderating a lot of other flavors, and absinthe and bubbly wine, champagne and or Prosecco, they are such good bedfellows that honestly, I think a dash or spritz of absinthe should come with every glass of champagne, unless it's very expensive champagne. The one question I have, and I'm gonna reserve it. Uh, this is my right. If this is a Greg original, we're gonna talk about Angostura bitters. I'm gonna add a dash, maybe two dashes of Angostura bitters. Bob's your uncle. Bam, bam, thank you, ma'am. Here we go. This is a uh, uh, just a couple of dashes of Ango. Listen. That helps the coffee come out and it tempers the astringency of the drink and it's waking up the anise notes of the absinthe ever so slightly. I'm not gonna lie, I think that this drink needs two dashes of Angostura bitters or the aromatic um, Amaro or bitters of your choice. I think Peixos would be interesting here. I think chocolate bitters would be interesting here. I think Elamacule Tiki bitters would be interesting here. I'm looking at a wall of Amaros over here right now. Um, Nonino, Chinar, uh, Amaro di Angostura, Averna, uh, Ciociaro. I think all of those in a small pour would be great here. You know, with those, maybe do a, do a bar spoon or two. With a real bitters, just stick to a dash or two. All of those little accentuations are really going to, I think, balance the string out, drink out, and bring it to the fore. And I have forgotten that I'm wearing a white unstructured jacket and teal undershirt, um, and that this is a drink about the worst drinks of the 80s. I have completely fallen into making this weird uh, death spasm brunch cocktail, and I'm very happy with it. Thank you all so much for joining me on what I thought would be a tour of the worst drinks of the 80s, in which I took the poetry of Brian Flanagan Nay, Tom Cruise in the 1988 film Cocktail, where he uh, delivers a rather long speech uh, from the bar top of a bar, I think in the movie is called Cell Block. I made all those drinks, made them all. The worst drinks of the 80s. Uh, they were all bad in mostly the same way. A few of them were really good, but I'm not really sure those were made in the way that they would have been made in the 80s, but I'm glad there were a few good ones here. Invented a couple of drinks, had a lot of fun along the way. I hope you enjoyed yourself, and if you did, uh, please like and subscribe the show. And I want to remind you that this episode of How to Drink was filmed in front of a live Twitch audience, and you can find me on Twitch at Greg from HGD. And furthermore, as I'm about to fall over, and furthermore, I've been making this show for so long that there are like 500 episodes of it. And if you're new to the show, well, here are four more episodes or things that I feel like you should know about. And I hope you enjoy 
Thank you so much. I will see you next time on another episode of How to Drink.